Hello and welcome to this discussion today, titled Cultural Capital versus Technological Capital, a critique of online learning commodity fetishism. Basically, this presentation is based on a conference paper which I wrote recently for the Levi de Mecanti conference taking place in September this year. It's very much an online learning conference which covers various topics, but in my paper, I'm going to talk about how online learning while beneficial, can sometimes also lead towards a phenomenon known as commodity fetishism. Instead of Marx's concept of being obsessed with material goods, what we have here is an obsession with downloading various apps, supposedly to enable us to learn better. But the problem is, when we download too many apps, does this really help us in learning the content of the subject? Or does it just jam up our smartphones? Can we talk about knowledge of technology as though it were a form of capital? Can we therefore call it technological capital? So the point is that, especially given the various lockdowns in numerous countries due to the coronavirus 2019 pandemic, there are many classes that were originally face-to-face, -face, but they have to be shifted online. And therefore, this poses a problem for both instructors and students because they will now have to shift their attention to learning how to use these apps. Of course, given the climate which contains various types of learning, including face-to-face -face and online learning, if one were to enroll in a course that was meant to be online originally, they would perhaps be prepared to deal with this issue of technological capital. However, when sudden emergencies happen that pushes people who originally registered for a face-to-face -face class to now learn online, I can't imagine how much anxiety this might cause. This is a parallel to having a lack of material resources. This is the digital divide. This is how a lack of technological capital can actually cause problems for a person who, despite their intelligence or motivation, really wishes to learn. So what I will highlight here, really, is the concept of technological dependency. I'm going to match this to Bourdieu's framework of cultural capital, which was used to explain differences in educational outcomes. But we are now moving to a new historical phase, perhaps, of a new era in which cultural capital isn't the only obstruction or obstacle, but it is now technological capital as well. I shall proceed to explain how this framework works. So, in my paper, I argue for a sociological imagination of the ways online learning can stratify individuals, in the same way possession of material goods does. So I'm going to use Bourdieu's framework of cultural capital, but I now augment this to include yet another type of capital, which is technological. I propose that this intangible aspect overrules cultural capital. And you might even match this to another concept, which I'm currently developing, anti-capital, which is like the negative space in art, whereby it's a collection of how much capital you do not have, as opposed to how much you do have. For example, an individual who comes from the bottom rung of social classes, who may have lost the daily income from a minimum wage job, is now faced with the task of accessing the internet to sit for their final exam. They have a family to support financially, and they lack the finances to settle their internet bills, as well as other bills. The internet connection may be cut. They may have to squat outside in the middle of the road for hours just to get a connection. They have to neglect like, like family duties, brave dangers. And they are unable to solve the problem, nor access the internet, especially if synchronous learning is prioritized. Now there are two forms of online learning, synchronous and asynchronous. The first means that everybody has to be available online at the same time, in real time, 
and the second means that for example I could record this video and you could watch it whenever you're free or whenever your internet connection is working. Synchronous learning is prioritized. People who already lack material resources and other forms of institutional support will already be disadvantaged because by not being virtually present to sit for their exam, they are failed. They're not even able to study before that. So the impact of the individual's unequal life chances is increased exponentially. Now this echoes sociologist Robert Merton's observation that famous scientists often get more credit for a research project than a lesser known or a known one, as mentioned by Tricano, 2013. In educational technology, this effect, also known as the Mathieu effect, applies not only to students, but also to teachers, for example, in their case of an overwhelmed teacher working in a rural environment, as Trikana also pointed out. Where it is almost impossible to acquire high-speed internet connection, computers that work, as well as knowledge of how to use these softwares, these apps, how to protect oneself from hackers, from virus attacks, from phishing, and so on and so forth. So in this section, I will show you a diagram or a PowerPoint that, in which I've drawn this picture of reduced theory of practice in a visualized form. So basically, this shows how the field is conceptualized as an arena in which individuals struggle for power. So an individual, for example, individual A or individual B, starts out with some capital. This is what gives them the basis of their power to compete as though they were entering into a competition, for example, running, singing, dancing, or whatever. So capital here is something that an individual already possesses, but it's also something that an individual is competing to possess more of. So this is part of Bourdieu's theory of practice, whereby the field of activity leads to the formation of relations between members. So you have various types of capital. You have economic capital, and you also have cultural capital, which is like a non-tangible counterpart of economic capital. So this could include values, lifestyle, beliefs. So you have three forms of cultural capital, three subsets, the objectified, the institutionalized, and the embodied. The embodied form is also known as habitus, or lift dispositions. The objectified form is also known as the consumption of commodities. And the institutionalized form is also understood as legitimacy accorded to your other forms of cultural capital. For example, education. So these are things that you might have already got the field. When you enter the field, to compete for more capital, which in this case is your educational outcome. So it is like a social space structured and organized around specific types of resources or capital for which field members compete. Therefore, your capital is both a weapon to use to your advantage and a stake to be worn in itself. The amount and type of capital which an individual possesses determines the relative position in the field. So now we're adding one more layer to cultural capital, which is technological capital. And when you have this capital and you're ready to compete, there are also rules of the game, which Bourdieu also termed as illusio, the formal rules of the game. However, one more aspect that can really help to increase one's advantage in this competition is the informal rules or doxa. Now, while illusio is defined as the rules of the game, or the belief that the game we collectively agree to play is worth playing, that we agree upon the same narrative. Doxa, however, is understood as the taken for granted shared knowledge of values, practices, and associated language of the field. Failure to know or abide 
by both the illusio and the doxa may result in having anti-capital, which then leads to social exclusion. despite lauding the benefits of online learning, fail to see how the so-called democratization of digital learning can actually also increase social exclusion. I thus highlight the need to analyze how a virtual platform can act as yet another multiplier of social exclusion, viewed through the lens of empty capital. So finally, what can we learn from all this? How does digital learning or online learning, whether synchronous or asynchronous, stratify individuals? Well, perhaps we can take the example of the following analysis of a hypothetical situation. So based on the framework above, the field is the online learning platform used by a classroom consisting of the instructor and the students. For example, our classroom. The social space is an arena structured around the knowledge of technological resources such as mobile learning apps or the electronic learning platform of choice. Several other apps may supplement mobile learning as to different websites for electronic learning given the multimedia nature of this course content. Access to these apps or websites is of course supposed to be equal, provided they do not come with a registration fee. However, there are certain apps which cost money to be downloaded, as do some websites providing content. We may of course assume that economic capital remains at a constant for all users, if they are using the free option. However. There is also another dimension to this, which we may consider as technological know-how. For every app or website that the user may be able to access, they may or may not be competent at using it at a basic level, or even at an advanced level, such as knowing keyboard shortcuts. Those who are already technologically savvy may be able to understand these advanced shortcuts and this might help them perform better at any learning-related task. For example, there are so many commands in Microsoft Word which can really help as shortcuts for you to complete assignments. And that really, really helps with saving time. But not everyone knows these. So, an individual who personally takes an interest in learning coding, for example, might know their way around an app even to the point of being able to modify or customize it. In the meantime, there may be another student in the same online class who has never learned basic computer skills, either due to income, social status, age or others. This person may, however, be proficient in the actual course subject matter, for example, sociology but they will fail to express their ability due to a lack of technological savvy. To educate them on technology would require the teacher or their classmates to spend additional time. And this is an educational task which some might find entirely auxiliary, 
entirely besides the point. Thus technological capital is another supplementary form of capital. Assuming economic capital is not a problem to begin with. As mentioned above or before, capital is both a weapon to use to one's advantage in the game and a stake to be won. The stake to be won here is the knowledge of the subject matter to be gained from the online class, as well as one's performance in the final assessment. Following that, there are also the rules of the game, which are the rules set by the instructor in class. This may include things such as online attendance, filling in quizzes, submitting assignments, and participating in online exams. Deadlines and submission platforms are embedded within the learning platform of choice. This is where the student has to grapple with two things, namely their knowledge of the subject matter and also their knowledge of technology. Needless to say, all individuals who have registered for the online class have collectively elected to believe in the same narrative of reality, which is thus the illusion or rules of the game. Thus, doxa or knowledge of how to use the rules of the game to one's advantage is now the use of technological capital, the informal knowledge. This is a supplementary form of capital mentioned above. Technological capital can be expressed as the possession of informal learning outcomes through the process of gaining rigor as an expert in technology, whether by one's friends or family, or even classmates or instructors. As mentioned above or before, failure to know or abide by the illusio as well as the doxa may result in social exclusion through the lack of capital or anti-capital. This means unsatisfactory performance in class, such as being tardy with assignment deadlines, failing to answer the final exam because of slow or unreliable internet connection, which is tragic, or being socially ostracized by group members in group projects because of perceived non-response which may be misunderstood as laziness. Thus, anti-capital in this instance includes several elements. Number one, the lack of technological knowledge. Number two, the lack of economic capital to fix the former issue. And number three, the lack of social capital, if one does not have friends who are also experts to help one learn these things. It has to be said, of course, that the same scenario could also happen to instructors, especially due to internet connection. Finally, in conclusion, given this discussion, an individual who possesses anti-capital is akin or similar to the idea of negative space in art. That is to say, they emerge on the periphery of the field of online learning. They are marginalized twice, first through a lack of economic capital, and then once again through a lack of technological capital. This paper and thus this presentation hopes to highlight an understanding of the issues faced by online learners as well as instructors in this new coronavirus-based pandemic.